Well, good evening, everybody. Yeah. How are y'all? I'm from Tennessee <laughs> in the USA. My name is Mark, and I've spent most of you last night, I think, but not everybody. I think not everyone was here. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about me, I'm a pastor from Tennessee, but I do a lot of traveling in many nations. Uh, about six months out of the year, I'm out of the out of the United States in different nations, and I'm training pastors and leaders. That's just the thing that's on my heart. Kind of the passion of my heart really is leaders. And the reason is because healthy leaders make healthy churches. And healthy churches bring a healthy gospel. And a healthy gospel transforms communities. But the same is, the opposite is also true. And unhealthy leaders, they make unhealthy churches. And unhealthy churches are preaching a gospel. Sometimes it's not even the gospel at all. And it can be a mess, you know. So uh, leaders and uh, church leaders uh, all over the world is really my passion. And so I've been really graced by the Lord to be able to travel for almost 30 years in uh, a lot of different nations. And um, I work with pastors and leaders. What I'm going to share with you tonight is something I think is really very important. It's really important for every believer. We all we all grow it's per, in these areas, but it's particularly important for leaders to grow. And so if you will uh, turn with me, we're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Yeah, actually, this is the only slide. So. Oh. <laughs> if you want to snap a picture, you've got it. <laughs> it's super simple tonight. This is it. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, 2 Peter, actually the last chapter, the last verse of 2 Peter, the last letter he wrote, the last words that Peter wrote to that we, that we know to the churches, okay? These are important final words, right? So he says this. Last words. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <coughs> to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Simple. He's saying, but His last message is grow. Grow. In grace. There are areas in which uh, uh, we need to grow in. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But in all of these areas, we're growing in the grace of Jesus Christ and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You, how many are aware that Jesus is bigger than our current revelation of Him? Right? Yeah. There's always more to Jesus. Always more. And Peter saw that. Peter understood that. And um, if you think about Peter... He went from a regular fisher, fisherman to a fisher of men. And, and then Jesus, he heard Jesus teach, he heard Jesus' call, just like we've heard Jesus' call, and responded to Jesus. We're following Jesus here. And he was given, uh, he was listening to Jesus' teaching. No man's ever taught like this before. He was watching miracles. He'd never seen a man do this before. And then Jesus gives him the power to do the same thing. Go and teach and go and perform miracles. Jesus gave it to him. This is, he's, never, he's never seen this before. And then one day he climbs a mountain with Jesus and James and John. And he sees Jesus in a way he's never seen him before. He's seen Jesus perform miracles. He knows he's not a normal man. But then Jesus trans transforms in front of him. I don't even know how to, what that looked like. You know, what does it look like? Something of his heavenly glory was, was seen that was not seen yet. And now he's seeing it. And, and Peter doesn't even know what to say. But of course he says something because he's Peter. If you read, it, it actually literally says, Peter, not knowing what to say, 
said, Lord, we should build three churches here, right? Yeah. Church of Moses, Church of Elijah, Church of Jesus. Of course, Jesus, yours is the most important church, of course. Right? But he's seeing Jesus in a new, fresh way. Uh, 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 there's always more to Jesus. That's the point, right? There's always growing. And so, he gets, you know, Peter gets, he, um, he denies the Lord. He, then the Lord forgives him, and he is used mightily on the day of Pentecost. Imagine, he's this person who completely denied Jesus is now used to preach Jesus. And there's a whole list of ups and downs of Peter's life. And at the end of his life, we see these words. It's okay. Guys, the last thing I want to say to you is grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. We're always growing. There's always more. There's always more of Jesus. He's infinite. And so we're always seeing him in fresh new ways. So Peter understood that in the end of everything, that it was growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus that matters most. So what I want to do tonight is kind of talk about the things, the areas that we need to grow in, and grow in grace in. And I want to do it uh, through the life of Peter and through the words of Paul. Okay? Paul, especially Paul's words to Timothy. So we're going to be reading in Timothy. You can see these scripture references are all in, in uh, the letters that were written to Timothy. So... We're going to be reading about what, what Paul said to Timothy and, um, and seeing how he encouraged Timothy to grow in grace as well. So I'd like to pray first. Can we pray? Oh, Father, thank you. We're so very grateful that you have opened our eyes of our hearts and you've helped us to see you. And Jesus, you've changed us. And you've given us hope. And you've given us life. And you've given us purpose. And you've put your spirit inside of us. And you're drawing us to you all the time. So Lord, we want to pray tonight that what you want to speak tonight would be clear. And each of us are in, are in different places and we're... We're in different parts of our journey. We're dealing with different things. And Holy Spirit, you know how to speak to us directly to our needs, exactly, exactly what we need to hear. So we're praying for that, God. Open our eyes and help us to see what we need to see. Speak the thing that we need to hear so that we can grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. And we thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your active work of your Spirit with us tonight. Lord, I thank you for these brothers and sisters and from so many different places and uh, oper operating in, in their own gifts and in the ministries that you have allowed them to operate in. So, Lord, I, I thank you for that. I pray, God, that you would just, your word tonight would, would sound loudly to us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about Paul and Timothy. But let me just back up a little bit and give you some context about Paul and Timothy because uh, Timothy was a spiritual son to Paul. So Paul was speaking into Timothy's life as a father. But we think of Timothy as young or maybe inexperienced just because of that. Paul was his mentor, but he was not inexperienced. He was very experienced. In fact, I wrote some things down here. Uh, he was a trusted friend and co-worker with Paul. He, he labored together with Paul. Uh, and so he journeyed with Paul through Phrygia, Galatia, Mysia, into Troas, and Philippi, and Berea. That's in Acts chapter 17. He was very involved with the church in Thessalonica. He gave that church support in a, very, uh, in a time of persecution. You can read that in 1 Thessalonians. Timothy, next, he was, he was sent from if Ephesus. He was sent to the church in Corinth to help bring some order to the Corinthian church. That's in 1 Corinthians 16. There was also a plan for Timothy to go to Philippi 
We know that from Philippians chapter 2. And then later, at Ephesus, apparently he was in leadership, maybe the pastor of Ephesus, of the church at Ephesus. And he was sent to Macedonia. And then he, com he accompanied Paul to Asia. And then he joined Paul in Rome when Paul was a prisoner there. We don't know. He may have actually been in prison there as well. Not sure. The records kind of indi indicate that. Okay, so Paul and Timothy were so close that the names, their names were listed together as the co-authors of Paul's letters to 2 Corinthians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. So Timothy was not inexperienced. He had a lot of experience. He, he, he traveled. He did, he had, so all this was going on, and yet Paul is writing these letters. Some of these are from 1 Timothy, from, some from 2 Timothy. So it's a whole... Um, there's a whole continuum of time here, but all through it, Paul is encouraging Timothy to grow in these three different areas. Okay, so, so if we could just think about this uh, as three areas that we also need to grow in. And the first thing is, uh, is knowledge. Okay, knowledge, so no, but it's not just knowledge like head knowledge. It's also like the biblical wisdom, it's the application of that knowledge. We are always growing in application of it. So, if um, in fact, why don't we, if you want to turn, maybe I can have somebody read these out loud. You guys can be involved in this too. Uh, so could somebody read 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17? <coughs> Recalling the people from what you have learned, and recalling too how from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which can give you the wisdom that leads to deliverance through trusting in Jesus the Messiah. All scripture is God, God's breath, and it's valuable for teaching the truth, convincing of sin, correcting faults, and training in the right living. Thus, anyone who belongs to God may be fully equipped for every good work. Yeah. So continue in what you have learned. Uh, and apparently, you know, we do know that, that Timothy had a mother and a grandmother that were, that were uh, believers, right? They were devout people. And so they helped him, lead him in the faith. And then he says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is inspired by God. And it's good to teach us. That means to tell us what we don't know. To re reprove us, to correct us in the ways that we... So teach us the way you should go. Correct us from going the wrong way. And then train us in righteousness. So that the man of God or woman of God could be equipped ready for good work. So how are you equipped? You grow in your knowledge of the scriptures. And then uh, 2 Timothy 2.15... Somebody read that one. Do the best to present yourself to God as one a worker who has not no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word. Yeah. Getting the word into you and then understanding how to get the word out of you. Okay. This is very, very important. And uh, Maybe we talked about this a little bit last night, but this is what we have to do as leaders. Uh, we, can't, we can't just uh, take the Word of God and give it out. Take the Word of God and give it out. Right? We have to take the Word of God, put it here, deep inside of us, let it work in us first. And change us. And so that 
we then give it out to the people. If we don't do that, uh, we end up not having the character that we need to maintain the ministry. So, okay, so this is knowledge, and here we've been talking so far about knowledge of the, of the Bible. What do we learn from the Bible? Well, okay, we can say we learn, we learn some things about God. Right? God, uh, what is God like? What is his nature? What is his, what is his, uh, what are his characteristics? What is he like? By the way, what is God like? Let's just talk about that just a minute. What is God like? Like us. He's true. Good. What? Uh, we are God. Uh, we are created in the image and likeness of God. So we are, God is like us, and we are also like us. Okay. He's given us some of His characteristics. Yeah. True. Yeah. Good. He's a creator. That's a good one. The spirit. Well. What is it? A refining fire. He's a refining fire. <sighs> he's holy. Good. What else? He's love. He's love. Wait. He's holy and love. Both. Both. Oh, okay. There's a tension here. There's a tension. He's holy, but he's loving. If he's holy, okay, everybody lift your hands up like this, okay? Yeah. Cup your hands, okay? And then pull really hard in both directions, okay? And and hold it. Just keep keep pulling, okay? And I'm going to talk to you. Okay, so it's tension. There's a tension in God. He is loving. 100% loving. God is love. You have to pull. Okay. 100% loving, right? Uh, and we love Him because He first loved us. God is not, it, um, it's not part of what God does. It's part of who God is. He's yes. love. He is love, right? The scripture says. So we know that His nature is to care for us and to be kind and, and generous and good to us. But also, He's holy, right? Pull. You got to pull. Okay, this is tense. Okay. <laughs> And so he's, he's holy, which means uh, everything that is around him must be holy as well. This is a problem because mankind is not holy. And how are we supposed to deal with a holy God? Well, how are we supposed to deal with a holy God if we're not holy? How can we be in his presence? It doesn't work. He loves us so much. He wants us with him. He's holy and we're not. So we're separated by our sins. How do these things how do these things reconcile, right? And the answer is, it's reconciled in the cross. That's the answer. In the gospel. Where God, in His holy Son, came down, lived a perfect, righteous life, and gave Himself for... You have to pull. Pull, pull, pull. Okay. There's a point. To, there's a point. Okay. All right. Because, and, and because He's holy, and because He uh, lived a perfect life, He could die a death for us because God loved us so much. He wanted us with him, okay? This this hurts, doesn't it? You can let go. This hurts right here. You're feeling it? Tension. See, so God is not very easily figured out, okay? And when you see him in his holiness, and you see him in his love both, sometimes there's a tension there. And that tension, you think, well, how could he be this and this at the same time? And if you go too far in this direction, you say, well, God is, God is loving. He loves everyone. And every, everyone's going to heaven. Because he loves everyone. Well, he does love everyone. But there's a problem. And he's holy. So if you go too far that way, you can get into heresy. If you go too far this way, the holiness, you're focusing on your, your own sin. You know? I'm, I'm no good. I'm not, as, I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Or you begin to put your own ideas of holiness onto God. And you think, okay, holiness... Mm, it's about uh, the clothes you wear, or the day you worship on, or something like that, okay? Or how long your hair is, or short your hair is, or do you wear makeup, or I don't know. Some people get weird, yeah? It's like, it's, it's, you can go off, if you go too far that way, it's also heresy, right? So you have to keep it in tension. And, and the tension, the solution to the problem, is the cross, it's the gospel. Okay, so... He's holy, he's loving. Okay, what else? Holy, loving, creator. Omnipresent. 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 He's everywhere. He's everywhere. Good. What else? Omnipotent. He's the Lord. Omnipotent. He's all powerful. Yeah, he has all power. He is sovereign Lord. Yeah. That's one of the most important revelations in the, whole, in the Bible is that he is sovereign Lord. He's outside, beyond us. He's transcendent, right? And he is in control. What else? String. The Hebrew says, I will be who I will be. 
who I will choose myself to be. Mm -hmm. So that's all. I am who I am. I am who I am. I am who I am. Yeah. Good. What else? Trinity. Generous. Jealous. What? Oh, jealous. 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 Not a jealous God. Just. Just. Ooh. What else? Trinity. Oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's a God in relationship. You know, isn't that amazing? His in. His character and nature is one of relationship. Is he, he's a God. He's a being in community. One God, but existing in three persons in community. That's beautiful. What else? He's the way, the truth, and the life. The way, and the truth, and the life. Good. Three and one. Good job. <laughs> and the door. Ben. And the door. And the bread. And the shepherd. And the water. <laughs> okay. okay, this is good. The first 15 or 20 are easy. Okay? There's fruit inside of us. How about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? How about the fact that He is comforter? He is counselor. He is the one who convicts us of our sins. He is the one who empowers us for, uh, for our work. He's the one that stops us when we need to be stopped and pushes us when we need to be pushed. All these things we can learn about the Holy Spirit. Okay, how about the Word of God and how to study the Word of God? We're growing in knowledge of the scriptures and the different uh, biblical genres of literature, and how do you read the how do you read the um, the epistles versus how do you read the law? It's a different way of reading. You, you have to read them a little bit differently versus how you read the, the history books, the parts of the scripture. So we're learning. We're always okay. We're always growing, right? Does that makes sense. You, you get it. You never stop growing. Always, as far as Peter went. At the end of his life, he was saying, grow, grow, grow in grace, grow in knowledge. There's more, there's always more to Jesus. A couple of things, too, I would like to say about knowing some things that we need to know. And this really is more practical. Uh, and this is really kind of from my experience. Um, I think the first thing is, I, I have to always be thirsty to know more. You know, there's not many things more sad than someone who thinks they know it and they have it all, right? Um, we can never have it all. God is infinite. And we're finite. And we're incapable of understanding infinite. But we are capable of growing in our understanding of it. And we're capable of uh, pressing in to see Him and growing more. Paul said, I haven't, not that I have already obtained, but this one thing I do, I press on. I press on to know Jesus. Forget what's behind, straining for what's ahead, I press toward this goal, the upward call of Jesus Christ. And it said, those of you who are mature should think this way. And the other thing I think we need to know it's very important and practical is we need to understand our seasons. The seasons of our life. Because knowing your season helps you understand what you need to do. Uh, you, you remember the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament. It says the sons of Issachar uh, understood their times and therefore they knew what Israel should do. So there's this link together of understanding my season and understanding what and guidance, guidance from God, understanding what I need to do, uh, because sometimes in this season there's a specific thing we need to be doing. It may change. There's a focus of this season, but later on in a different season it may change. There was a specific time in my life that I had been uh, traveling for many years, but my children reached an age where uh, they really need their, they needed their dad to be home more. And although my burden still, my heart passion still, is for uh, training leaders in the nations, I felt the Lord was saying to me, I, I know that you'll go for me, but will you stay for me? In this season, I need you to stay. Because I need you to be a father. I need you to build a foundation into your children. 
And so for many years, seven or eight years, I didn't travel at all. And I was, I was working on being a father, and I was also working on a building project for our church. And all of those, that time, God was building into me the skills to not only be a physical father, but to be a spiritual father. And have spiritual sons and daughters. And not only to build a physical building, but to help build the spiritual building. Build uh, people and not just buildings. So, um, understanding our seasons are really, really important. I think of Psalm 31. In Psalm 31, uh, David says this, um, you know, it's when his enemies were surrounding him and they were looking for a way to kill him. And he said uh, this beautiful verse that uh, my times are in your hands, right? Lord, my times are in your hands. He understood that. He was hiding in a cave. He had already been anointed king by Samuel. Samuel the prophet, whose words always came to pass. It says, not a word dropped to the ground that Samuel spoke. So Samuel had found David and anointed him king. And yet, it was a long period of time between that moment and when David became king of Judah and Israel. I think it was 14 years, it could have been 16 years, something like that. Uh, and part of that time was when he was hiding in the cave from his enemies, praying to God, God, my times are in your hands. Okay. And so, understanding your seasons, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, they all had parts of their life where they tasted what they were going to do, but then they were kind of isolated and brought out into a place. For example, Jesus was 12 years old in the temple. And he was doing what he was going to be doing. He was teaching. And he was teaching the kingdom of God. And he was amazing all of the, the teachers. He was teaching the teachers. This 12-year-old kid. And then his parents come back and they say, you know, he says to them, don't you understand I have to be about my father's business. And then he submits to them. This is funny. He submits to them. He goes back with them. And for 18 years, we don't know what happened except the little verse in Luke that says that he grew in wisdom, in stature, favor with God, and favor with man. That's, that's um, mentally, physically, spiritually, socially. He grew. Jesus had to, to grow. He got a taste of what he was supposed to do. But then there was a season when he had to be pulled out of the game, so to speak. You know, he got a little action in the game, and he got pulled out of the game, and then he was able to grow. Imagine, the Son of God had to grow in wisdom and stature, favor with God, favor with man. And then, when the time came, he did more in three and a half years than any other man has ever done, right? So understanding your time. Sometimes there's a season to be teaching in the temple. Sometimes there's a season to submit to those people who are in authority over you. So you can grow. And then there's a season where you're released again. So if you wonder, what am I supposed to do, Lord? Guide me, Lord. I need to hear your voice. That, the answer to that is almost always tied to your seasons. Your season of life. What is going on right now? Okay. Let me tell you one more story. Uh, there's a man named Ahimeaz in the Old Testament. Anybody remember Ahimeaz? Nobody knows Ahimeaz. It's a little obscure story. Ahimeaz. Well, David, David's at war. The nation's at war. David's son is the, is the general. And uh, they're at war. And they win, they win a battle. And Ahimeaz is a man who wants to run back and tell 
the kingdom news. You know, back in the day, they didn't have text. They didn't have like anything. You couldn't, you couldn't wire the news to someone. You had to run the news to somebody. And so Ahimeaz told the general, um, I want to I wanna run. Let me run. Let me run. And tell the king. And, and the general said, you don't have the full story. You don't know exactly what to tell him. But he said, let me run. Let me run. But we don't know exactly what's, what uh, has happened to David's son. And, you know, David's going to want to know what happens to his son. But Ahimeaz said, let me run, let me run. And so the general said, run. So he ran. And then he's coming to David, and David's, uh, David's um, attendant says, I see someone coming, it looks like Ahimeaz. And Ahimeaz comes, and he says, O king, live forever. God has given your enemies into your hand this day. And the king David says, what about my son? And Ahimeaz said, I don't know. And the king said, step aside. Stand aside. He was trying to run when he didn't have the message. There are some times when we have this zeal, we want to run. We want to do something. We have, but God still needs to put a message inside of us. Those years that I told you about when I stayed home and I was not running and I was not, you know, in the nations, God was building specific messages into my life about how to father and how to build. And I find that He's made me a father and a builder in His kingdom. What I was doing in the natural, He made me in the spirit. This is part of what I do. But I wouldn't have had a message. Most of what I'm telling you now, I would not have even known then. I had to wait and let God build it into me. And so sometimes we have to be aware of our seasons and we have to, we have to wait. Things don't always happen in our timing. Right? Okay, so we have to know the scripture. We have to know God. We have to understand the work of the Spirit. We have to know our seasons. And we have to know that God is bigger than our current revelation of Him. But the, but the Scripture says that God, uh, those who know the Lord, will do exploits, right? So it's not just about knowledge or wisdom. It's also about skills, ministry skills. So let's read 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. Therefore, I remind you to steer up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Mm. Stir up the gift that's in you. Good. So, a few pages back, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. Somebody can read that one. Do not neglect the gift that is given in you, which has which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Okay. Good. Okay. So Paul's reminding Timothy of something that happened. Uh, there was a gift that was imparted to Timothy, and we don't know what it is. We're not exactly tell, told what it is, but but Paul knew what it was, and Timothy knew what it was. <laughs> Timothy, there's something that was a gift given to you, but don't neglect it. Stir it up. Some English versions use that phrase, instead of stir it up, fan it into flame. Like you have a little ember or a, a little um, coal, and you, you keep until it bursts into flame, right? There's something you're, you're continuing to attend to it until it becomes a flame. You have something small. Work at it until it becomes something big. So, it's attention. Is this a is this a work of God or is it a work of man? Yes. Both. Yes. <laughs> work of God and a work of man. God gives the gift, but we stir it up. 
we attend to it. We don't neglect it. We grow in that gift. So God has a part that we can't do. But we have a part that God doesn't do. God won't do. Okay, we have to re be responsible for it. So I don't know what the gift was. Maybe, let's just say it was the gift of teaching. Maybe it was a teacher. Um, so, so uh, Timothy, you were given a gift of teaching. Okay, how do you stir that one up? Well, you study. And you, you, you get with mentors and you, you learn from people how to dis you know, discern the Word of God and how to present the Word of God and how to, to communicate it in a way that people can understand it. And you practice it. You work at it. And you get better and you get better at it. So you're taking what God's given you, like that parable of the talents. There's a talent given, but you take it and you multiply it. It comes from God. It doesn't come from us. So glory goes to Him, right? Mm -hmm. He's the source. But we have to do something with it. So that's what this is about. And by the way, we don't know how, how many years. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys know how many years it was between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. I don't know for sure. But there was a time period between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And Paul felt the need to tell Timothy both times, don't forget your gift. Stir up your gift. Don't neglect your gift. It's important. We have to remember to, to, to work with God, what God's given us. So what are we talking about here? Well, uh, spiritual gifts. Romans, Romans chapter 12 speaks about God has given to us a gift of grace and a measure of faith. And so what you've been given, you should use it. The part of your worship to God is using what He's given you. So if you... If your gift is teaching, then teach. If it's giving, then give. If it's um, prophecy, then prophesy. If it's uh, exhortation, then exhort. Do you see a pattern here? Whatever you are, be that. Be that to the people around you. Whatever your gift is. So, what are your spiritual gifts? Do you know? It's, that's a good thing to, to study. And, and um, there are... There are um, Good teachings on that, and they're good uh, ways, uh, kind of ways to help you understand uh, if you're more inclined from one, one gift to another. Uh, there are three different lists of gifts of the Spirit, by the way. There's one in Romans, one in Ephesians, and one in 1 Corinthians. So what are your gifts? Uh, what are your natural abilities? What can you do that, that I can't do? So there are ways. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Your, all your mind, all your strength, right? Okay, you have, you have strengths and abilities and gifts and a personality that I don't have. So there are ways that you can love God and love people that I can't because I don't have your gift. And I have ways that I can love Him that you don't have my gift to. You love people as well. What do you have to give people and to, get, and to give God? What are your abilities? Um, so these are natural abilities. Also, uh, skills such as people skills. Learning how to actually operate socially and relationally and emotionally in a way that will create a safe place for people or that will allow you to communicate well to people. Um, it could be ministry gifts, like we talked about teaching. So a ministry gift or... Um, it could be not, it could be um, not not um, uh, spiritual gifts. It could be your normal um, uh, uh, natural gifts. What natural? Yeah, natural gifts. Yeah, your natural gifts, and also your calling or your your vocation. Even if you're a doctor, you learn strengths. If you're learning to be a doctor, learning to be a business person, learning. To be a, a hands-on, like a craftsman or something, or an artist, it is learning more and more. So what you're doing is you're growing in this area here. Okay, so a couple of things I've learned um, concerning this, and the first one is that um, I'm I'm not like everyone else. That's really important. You're you're not like everyone else either. Right? Um, and I'm thinking of what Paul said in Romans 12. In Christ we are one body, but 
many members, you know, each, each one, each members differently and different gifts according to the grace given to us. So we have different gifts. Um, I'll just tell you my story. Uh, when I came on staff at the church where I'm now pastoring, I was a very uh, part-time, just barely above volunteer. <laughs> I was given a little, little bit of a stipend of money uh, for my service, and it wasn't much. But, um, but I was intimidated because the people uh, who were, the man who was the pastor and the man who was the second pastor, the associate pastor, they were very bold. They were very, um, they had very strong pulpit ministries. They were very strong evangelists. They had a very different personality than me. I just am not like them at all. But, when, but they were my models. And so I thought, I need, I need to be like them. And so I tried to be somebody that, I, that I'm not. And it was very unnatural. And it was a lot of pressure on me. And it wasn't, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> it just wasn't very successful. Okay, and, but God was very faithful to me in the scriptures and also through the encouragement of my friends that, uh, that told me, Mark, this church doesn't need another one of them. This church needs a you. And I'm just laid back. I'm kind of more chill. I'm more relational. I'm a teacher. I'm a prophet or a proclaimer or an evangelist. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a relational teacher, pastor guy. You know, the, the church didn't need another one of them. It really did need one of me. So that did two things for me. First of all, it took the pressure off of me. Because I, I can be me. I can do that. That's not hard. That's very easy. I can just do that. And not only that, it helped me realize that what I have to offer is valuable. It's valuable. You know, strangely, I became more and more involved there in the church. And all over, although the senior pastor was always the senior pastor... And always had those, those, those strong gifts. Um, oftentimes, people would come to me and say, you know, I know he's the pastor of the church, but really, you're the pastor of the church. And w what they meant was, it wasn't like a power play or anything. It was, it was that um, I appreciate and receive and honor his gifting, but he's not a pastor at heart. You're a pastor at heart. And you're very important to this church. The people would encourage me through the years of that. So I learned I'm not like everybody else. And so I can't try to be everybody else. And, it, and if I can, if you, if we can free ourselves from being what we're not. And free ourselves to be what we are. We can be successful and very powerful in what we are. So oh, that's really important. So number one, I learned that not I'm not like everybody else. And number two, I learned that everybody else is not like me. Which almost sounds the same, but it's really a little bit different. When the Bible says to be completely humble and gentle and bear with one another in love. Bear with them. So it, the people who are not like you, bear with them. Understand and value them. Value them. We have different gifts. And so, um, it's not that they're wrong, they're just different. And I need them. I need their perspective. This probably was most obvious to me in my wife and I, in our marriage. Okay. Um, how many people are married here? Okay, awesome. So, how many of you, your spouse is very different than you? I think that's every hand, every hand that raises. We don't usually marry the same, the person who's just like us, right? We, we, we marry somebody that's different than us in some way because we admire them. It's like, they're strong in a way that I'm not strong. We have the same passion maybe for Jesus, whatever, but we don't have the same personality or giftings. And, 
Because sometimes opposites attract, right? But sometimes opposites attack. <laughs> if you don't, you're not walking in the spirit. My wife, and if you weren't here last night, uh, my wife passed away about a year and a half ago uh, from pancreatic cancer. Uh, but we were married for 30, 32 years. And so uh, we had a long time to grow together and to learn each other. And she is in many ways so opposite than me. You know, I am very much um, strategic thinking, maybe, uh, sort of analytical. I'm, I'm a learner. I'm, I can see processes. I'm a teacher. And she was relational. She was very smart emotionally. She had a high EQ, emotional function, you know. So it's like, so maybe she, she always thought that I was smarter than her because I was just a thinker, but she was way smarter than me emotionally, way smarter than me. She had, she has like this um, satellite dish on her head and she walk into the room, she can feel the feelings. <laughs> she just felt you, and she felt what was going on in the room, and she felt she could connect to you, you know? And sometimes we would leave, leave a meeting like this, and she would say, oh, man, did you feel that? And I thought, I mean, there was probably something there. <laughs> I don't think I... Did I feel something? I don't know. I wasn't thinking about feeling something. I was thinking about, you know, talking to people. But what I learned to do is that when she said, did you feel that? I learned to say, yeah, what was that? <laughs> and she, she made me, she enriched me in, in that emotional area. And she helped me understand uh, how to connect with people and to make people feel like they're safe and feel like they're cared for. She always cared for you. She always saw you. And she always connected with you. But you know, we, it took a long time for us to understand that about each other. I remember, I remember having arguments with her, disagreements, whatever you want to say. And, and, I, would, and I would leave that situation and I would just think, oh, the Bible says we should, un we, we should live, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Okay? I was thinking, God, am I supposed to understand that? <laughs> I don't even know what that is, what she's feeling, what is that about? And we had uh, a lot of opportunity to grow <laughs> in, in that area. But, but understanding that she was not like me and she was valuable... And, and um, placing value in that and listening and learning from her was really important. And that's what Paul said when he was talking about the whole idea of the body of Christ. Maybe Paul and Barnabas, you know what happened with Paul and Barnabas? They were working together. It was all awesome until it wasn't. And they had a disagreement over John Mark. And it said there was very sharp disagreement as they almost came to blows, right? I mean, I, don't, I can see that. I don't know. Paul, Paul was a driven man. He was a type A personality. He was like, you know, all in, and he was zealous, and Barnabas was an encourager. Barnabas. That was not even his name. His name was Joseph. But they, they called him Barnabas because he was a son of encouragement. He was always encouraging people. He always see somebody and see potential in them. And I know what you can become. And I think I'd like to bring you into that. In fact, he did that with Paul. He brought Paul to the brothers in Jerusalem. He said, I think this guy's got something. And they said, do you know who this man is and what he's done? He has persecuted the church. No, I think he's got something. And he was right. So... Maybe it was their difference in, in personality and temperament or gifting even that caused them to come to that, to that issue, you know? Because Barnabas was 
wanted to give John Mark another try. And Paul said, I don't have time for that. I ain't got time for that. I got to find somebody else. So they had this disagreement. Okay, so we have to understand that, understand and tolerate and value the people that are around us. So we grow in knowledge, we grow in, um, that's biblical wisdom, we grow in, in, in our uh, activity, our ministry skills, our strengths, those kind of things, and we're always growing. That should be an arrow too. We're always getting uh, better and better at that. But there's a third area that's even more important, the most important, and that's what we're going to talk about after the break. So we're going to take a little break. How long should we break for? Five minutes. What? Five minutes. 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 Jesus Christ. Ways, some ways we grow. Knowledge, biblical wisdom, skills, what we do, spiritual skills and strength. But the, the third one, most important. So somebody want to read uh, chapter 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 21 and 22. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of the pure heart. Mm. So there's something to flee and something to follow after. Right? There, and so there's things that are dishonorable and things that are honorable. And there's a difference, and leaders have to know the difference. Actually, just followers of Jesus have to, follow, have to know the difference, but especially leaders have to know the difference. And so you're following after uh, righteousness, pursuing, running after it's like there's a race. There's, there's something ahead. We're going toward righteousness. We grow in righteousness. Faith. We grow in faith. Love. We're growing in this love and peace. Okay, so that's important. We're calling on the Lord with a pure heart. As much as we know, as much as we understand what purity is right now, we're, we're, we're seeking that. We love what's pure. Now, let's go back a, a couple of pages to... 1 Timothy 4, 12. Again, uh, both letters, Paul is emphasizing this. So, someone want to read that? Anyone look down on you because you are young, but expect an example from the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Mm -hmm. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Outlive them. That's what he's saying. Outlive them. Outlove them. Outpure them. This is what he's saying. Uh, outspeak them. Not like too much speak, but better speech, right? Um, outfaith them. Outpure them. This is this is what he's saying. Be an example. Raise the bar. You know what I mean? Raise the bar. Where you are. This is normal. This is normal. Timothy, raise the bar. Wherever you are. In your faith, in your purity. Be an example. When people look at you, they should say, that's what a Christian looks like. Okay, so what we're really talking about here is we're talking about character. The character of Jesus inside of us, okay? This is the most important thing. God is more concerned with who I am than He is with what I do. I'm convinced that God is not impressed with what I know. Because I don't know much. <laughs> I'm convinced that God is not impressed with what I can do. 
because he's so much greater. He can do so much greater. But I do know what God is convinced, what God is impressed with. God is impressed with his son. And when his son's character is being formed in me, that makes him smile. That's beautiful. You know, you can actually look through the book of Timothy and the book of Titus, and Paul is uh, writing a list to Timothy and Titus about the characteristics of leaders in the church. He's saying you need to set elders in the church and set deacons in the church. And here's what these men need to, to be like. And by implication, here's what women need to be like. This is what believers and followers should be like, especially leaders. And he has these lists that should be. And he lists them all. If you, if you get them all together, put them all together, there's 20 of them. 20 characteristics of what a leader should look like. Okay? Out of the 20, only one has to do with knowing or doing. An elder should be able to teach. That means he, he should know the scriptures and be able to say it. 19 out of 20 have to do with character. I don't know how your math is, but that's, that's 95%. 95% of leadership is right here. This is good. This is important. We grow in these things. But this is the most important. Why is this most important? Because what we can build with our knowledge and our ability, we can tear down with our poor character. And you know that. You, you probably know people. Like ourselves. Like ourselves. <laughs> Me included. Yeah. But you can, you were, you know, uh, you could probably think of great ministries right now that were, that were going so well, and some character flaw in the ministry, and and now that ministry is crashed, and the effectiveness of that ministry, which could have gone on and done so much good, is discredited because of a poor character. I'm thinking about when Paul. Uh, Remember when Paul, was it Paul and Silas or was it Paul and Barnabas? I'm not sure about that. Paul was in, uh, I think it was Silas. But I'm not sure. They were in one town and they were being followed around by this lady. Remember this lady who was, who was demon possessed? And she was saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. You should listen to them. And... The key, she kept following them around and said, these, these people, these people. And Paul turned around, finally, he had enough of it. He turned around and rebuked the demons and shut her up. Why did he shut her up? I mean, what she was saying was true. They were servants of the Most High God. And they were hoping people would listen to them too, right? They were. But why did he shut her up? And I think he shut her up because even the truth, when it's proclaimed by a demon, is discredited. Right? Okay, so it's true, but that person's saying it. So I don't know. I know that person. I know the character of that person. And even though it's true, it's discredited. So it's, it's possible to even speak the truth, but ineffectively, because your character is speaking louder than your than your knowledge or your your words and the truth that's coming out. And it's like, I can't receive from that person because there's something wrong with that person. You know, I know that they're not consistent. What Their life is not consistent with what they're saying. And because it's not consistent, I can't receive from their ministry. It's, so we're, we, we lack credibility because our character is not. So God's constantly working on character. He's always doing that. Timothy, be an example. Outlive them, outlove them. So let's think a minute about, now, I, I've got this in a, in a little line here. I usually draw this on, you know, kind of uh, as I'm doing it, uh, but we didn't have something to draw on today, so I have this little uh, slide here. But uh, usually, you know, this is not really a straight line. No, 
you don't develop character just like by uh, by just carefully uh, or just step by step getting uh, getting more and more like Christ. It really goes more like this. It cycles like this. It's not a straight line, okay? And usually it's like victories, defeats. <laughs> yeah, great, great things I'm doing, mistakes. You know, uh, great fruit. Of righteousness, oh, sinful attitude, sinful action, lack of faith, great faith, lack of faith. <laughs> this is like, does anybody relate to that? This is the way it, it happens. It happens in cycles like this. So I was thinking about this with, with um, the life of Peter. If we look at Peter, who's saying, growing grace in the knowledge of Jesus, right? Well, he starts out as a Jew... Under, uh, under, under the Roman, in a, in a time in history that was very difficult, right? So they're under Roman oppression. This is a difficult time. He's just a, a regular tradesman. He's a fisherman. It's just a normal job, right? So he's, but he, it's a normal job in a tense situation. Palestine in the first century was a tense situation. You know, we have an outside power that's that's ruling over us, and there's always there's a talk about tension. It's tension here. Okay. So he starts out in a difficult position, but but Jesus calls him. This rabbi calls him to follow him. A special man. So he went from you know like we said fisher fisherman to fisher of men. So he's got this is this is great, right? Uh, and he's doing miracles in the name of Jesus, and they come back and they say, "This is great, Lord. We're able to cast out demons in your name." And and then Jesus said, uh, "You need to be adjusted a little bit. It's not really about the power. It's really that your name is written in heaven. It's really about what I've done for you, and that there's a relationship here." It's, it's about the fact that the gospel is at work in your life. Not the power, but the truth of the gospel. Okay, he had to learn that lesson. So they're sent out again. And they're casting out demons, and they can't cast one of them out. It's, it won't go out. And then Jesus comes and says, okay, you got to learn a lesson. Okay, the lesson is, some of these don't come out unless you pray and fast. Okay, this is important. A little, a little thing, right? And then, okay. Okay. And then, they're in a boat, and Jesus comes walking on the water. And Peter says, if that's really you, tell me to step out on the water and come to you. What is he even thinking? I mean, think about that. Would you, would you do that? If it's really you, tell me to come to you. I don't know where that came from. Where did that, where did that even thought come from? So, he, But he does it. He calls him, and he steps out of the boat, and he's on the water, and he's on the water. He's on the water, and he's walking on the water. And he's, he's taking steps. This is incredible. That's a pretty high point in your ministry, don't you think? Uh, and then he takes his eyes off of Jesus, right? He begins to look at the waves, and he starts to become fearful, and he begins to sink, right? And he's sinking, and, and Jesus has to catch him and lift him up again. He learned another lesson, right? So this is some ups and some downs. Oh, and then they're on the mountain of transfiguration. He sees something that very few eyes on earth have ever seen the manifestation of the glory of Jesus as it is in heaven on earth transfigured what is this and so that's that's a high point for sure he says lord this is so good for us to be here we should build three three churches right okay so we're going to build one for Moses Elijah one for you and it says, Peter, not knowing what to say, said that. 
And then the, he hears this voice from heaven. So Jesus is there. Moses is there. Elijah is there. Moses and Elijah are his heroes. They're the heroes of his faith. This is who I've heard about my whole life. The great lawgiver, the great prophet. And they're there. And, and the scripture says they were speaking to Jesus about what he was going to go through in Jerusalem. And, and Peter says, this is great. This is the best conference I've ever been to. Let's keep it going forever. I mean, I love that conference. That sounds like a good conference to me. And here's the voice from heaven. Well, uh, Moses and Elijah disappear. Only Jesus. And there's a voice from heaven. This is my son. I love him. Listen to him. So Peter got rebuked from heaven. That's a down. <laughs> right? And so then what else happens is Jesus' ministry is gaining momentum and um, crowds are building and then Jesus begins to talk about his crucifixion. He's finished with his Galilean ministry. He turns toward Jerusalem. He begins to talk to Peter about his of everyone, the disciples, about his crucifixion. And Peter... Rebuke, rebukes Jesus. Peter says, you're wrong, Lord. <laughs> okay. you got to love Peter. He's very honest. I don't agree with you. This is not true. You can't be crucified. You're not going to be crucified. Okay, right before that, when Jesus said, who can men say that I am? Well, some say, John the Baptist, some say, you're a prophet, you know? And he says, who do you say I am? I think you're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. And you are blessed, Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. This came to you from God. You're blessed. And then, almost like the next breath. <laughs> Peter is all like this, man. On the next breath, he rebukes Jesus. You'll never go to the cross. You can't go to the cross. And Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. Okay. <laughs> when Jesus calls you the devil, this is not a good day. <laughs> right? Right. That's not a good day. So he goes from getting this revelation from heaven and being affirmed by Jesus to being, get behind me, because, Satan, because you are not savoring the things of God, but you're savoring the things of man. You're thinking of like a man. Peter, don't think like a man. Peter, don't think like a man. <laughs> so this is really, this is a low time, right? Oh, Peter, come on. He gets rebuked by, by Jesus. He's just been rebuked by the Father in heaven. Now he's rebuked by the Son. By the way, in the book of Acts, he was rebuked by the Holy Spirit too. When the, when the vision came down from heaven, you know? Peter's the only man I know in history that was rebuked by all three persons of the Godhead. Okay, so if, if God can use Peter, he can use you. Don't ever doubt it. Don't doubt it. But you're going to have these times. You're down like this. And then the ministry is up again. They're coming into Jerusalem. Jesus is on a donkey. All the crowds are... This could be it. This could be what we're waiting for. The crowds are coming. They're laying these palm trees branches down and they're saying Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. They're saying Messiah, this guy, this is our hope. This is it, guys. We've been waiting for it. And, and then it doesn't really turn out that way. The whole next week, it's all opposition. And it all goes way downhill from there. Triumphal injury um our ministry, we're finally going to go through. Jesus is going to, we're going to rule with him. We're going to be on his team. We're going to see Rome defeated. And then there's the arrest and there's the denial. And, G and Peter had just said, I'll never deny you. Even if they all deny you, <coughs> I will deny you. I don't know about these guys. I don't feel very good about them. But I know me, I'll never deny you. 
Peter, before the cock crows, before the rooster crows, three times. And he does it. He does it. And Jesus is arrested. And Jesus is he's beginning this, this trial, which is not really even a trial. It's not a fair trial. And when Peter's time comes to be able to stand or deny, he denies. Some little girl, servant girl, points to him. And he cowers. Not once, but three times. And then Jesus dies. Jesus dies. Jesus, the one who was supposed to be the Messiah. And I had all these ideas about what it was going to be, and he's going to save us from Rome, but he's dead now. He's dead. It's over. And Peter just said, I'm going fishing. Because I don't know anything else to do. What do you do? I was a fisherman. I'm called into this great movement. Incredible things happen, but it didn't turn out. I go back to what I know. I'm going fishing. And he goes back fishing. And Jesus comes to him again. Comes to them, and he calls to them. And then, because Jesus had risen from the dead, and then Jesus... Begins, this is like, okay, he's down here fishing, right? And then, and then this is, Jesus calls to them, and then Jesus, it says in the book of Acts, for 40 days, Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God. After his resurrection, Jesus died. Jesus lives. Jesus is teaching a conference <laughs> on, on the kingdom. I'd like to be at that conference. That's the one I want to go to. 40 days on the kingdom of God. That would be awesome. Okay. And he said, you need to stay right here and wait till you get power from on high. And when power comes on you, you're going to be my witnesses all the way out to the whole world. And that's what happened. Pentecost happened. Out of that, out of that place where Jesus is now gone, we're unsure what's going to happen. He's not with us anymore. And, you know, all of these religious people are angry with us. This is, what are we, what's going to happen? I don't know what the future looks like. And then, and then the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost, fills them up. And, and Peter, who do you call? Who do you call when you need a preacher? You call a big mouth person, right? A person who always talks all the time. <laughs> a person who, you call Peter. And they put him forward. Actually, if you read the book of Acts, it kind of it, it basically implies that they put Peter forward. They said, okay, I don't know what's this is amazing. I don't even know what this is, but it's amazing. This is and people are asking questions, Peter. Okay, here I am. Now it's time. It's time to preach. <laughs> and he opens his mouth. And from the Old Testament. All the way up through his own spirit, out of his mouth comes this powerful word. Thousands are saved. Thousands are saved. One day, in this initiation of the kingdom of God here, and God's using him, imagine that. And then there's more miracles to turn the page. In, in, in the book of Acts, there's an, a miracle the next day. Peter and John, and a lame man, and he's healed. And there needs to be another sermon. And there's a sermon. Peter's always cast in the net. By the way, if you notice that Peter, when Jesus called him, what was he doing? Do you know? He was fishing. It says something very specific. It says he was casting a net. He was casting his nets. Jesus called him casting a net. And casting a net was a characteristic of Jesus of Peter's ministry. Wherever Peter went, he was casting a net. Pentecost, cast a net. Catch some souls. A healing, cast a net. Catch some souls. Cornelius' house, right? Cornelius calls him, and he, can, he comes, he casts a net. Do you know what John was doing when Jesus called John? John and James, they were both fisher, fishermen too with their, with their father, right? It says that he was mending nets. He 
it was fixing the net. You know, the nets would get broken sometimes and the fish fall through the holes. You can't have that. So he's mending the nets. He was taking care of the nets so that they'll function right. And if you read the, the, the Gospel of John and the letters of John, the epistles of John, John is cat, he's, he's, he's mending the nets of the church. He's fixing broken doctrine. He starts his gospel off with a, an attack on, on the two main heresies that were going on right there. You know, he talked, in the, he's, the Word was with God. The Word was God. I mean, from the beginning, he's speaking directly to these heresies that were going on in his... Um, in his gospels, the same kind of thing, or in his in his epistles, the same kind of thing, and he, and with love, the Son of Thunder, who became the Apostle of Love, transformed by Jesus, he was he was mending the nets of the church. Beautiful, beautiful picture. So Peter's casting a net, and then Peter gets thrown in jail. Well, that's kind of down here, right? <laughs> He's in jail, and then he gets. He gets broken out of jail by an angel. That's, that's pretty much a high, isn't it? That's pretty good. But still Peter has something in his heart that needs to be changed. So he's praying one day, and he sees this sheep come down from heaven full of all these animals that he's never been allowed to eat. They're unclean animals. And there's a voice that says, Peter, stand up and eat. And Peter, because he's Peter, said, no way. <laughs> no way. I will never eat unclean food. I have not eaten these foods in my life. And I'm not about to start right now. No. <laughs> and he gets rebuked again. <laughs> he gets rebuked and told, again, rise and eat. Rise and eat. Rise and eat. How many times do I need to tell you? Don't call what I call clean, unclean. Okay, wow, that's deep. I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> On the door, there's a knock. And the man comes from Cornelius. Cornelius, who was a Gentile. Cornelius, who, you know, the kind of Gentile that the Jews don't deal with. They don't want the Gentiles. Jews, salvation is of the Jews. We're the chosen people. But God wanted Peter to see this is bigger than just Jews. Cornelius is a godly man. He's a God-fearer. He seeks after God even though he's a Gentile. God gives him a message and he gives Peter a message and he connects them together and, Paul, and Peter realizes, I get it now. Don't call unclean what I've called clean. I shouldn't call the Gentiles clean. Peter realized his own prejudice in his own heart. You see? So he's down here. He's up here. This is going on. I don't, we don't know everything else that happened in Peter's life. But we know the very end of his last words he spoke to us in 2 Peter. It was the growing grace. The growing the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we go like this. Here's what has been my experience. There are ups and there are downs. We shouldn't despise the downtimes. What we think is a downtime. What we think when things feel like they're falling apart to us. Or, or we feel like we're being disciplined for some reason. That's not a bad time. That's not a bad time. That's a good time. If we listen... God speaks to us in those down times. And what I've understood in my life and also in the lives of many people that I know that are, that are leaders at a high level is that there are these ups and downs that we're always learning. And at some point, as we're going up and down, there's a real crash. And we see ourselves down here with a little flame coming up. And we're burnt. We're just burnt out. It's a disappointment. It's a it's a, an expectation that we thought would happen, but it didn't happen. It's a it's people that we thought 
or our friends that betray us. It's being let down by, by people in the church. You know, we can, get, we can be let down by people in the world and we kind of think, well, we've, we expect that. But people in the church, it shouldn't happen, should it? But it happens. And we get hurt. Or there's, um, there's a vision that you have that is delayed. You have a vision in your heart, but it's not time yet. And like David, you find yourself hiding in a cave. You're already anointed king. And you're wondering if you're going to live past tonight. Because they're, they're all circling you. Whatever the circumstance is, it crushes you. It breaks you. And there's, a, there's an entire genre of literature dedicated to those times in the Bible. It's called the Psalms of Lament. There's 150 psalms, 50, at least 50 of them, can be called psalms of lament. And they teach us how to deal with our hurt and our fear and our pain and our discouragement and our desperation and our anger because of injustice and our repentance. It teaches, it teaches us how to walk through those times in a healthy way. And if you look through those psalms of, of lament, there are these, there's this pattern of turning to God in your pain, turning to God, and crying out honestly. Those psalmists say things to God that we think, how can you say that to God? Can you say that to God? God, I thought you were faithful, but you're not. Just look at my life. You're not. God is good to Israel, but as for me, that's what it says, not, not for me, not to me. He hasn't been faithful. So God, we're, we're calling out to God in our hurt and our pain and being honest. And so, you know, that's the first step to healing is being honest, turning to God first, and being honest. So one of my, there have been many times like this in my life. One of them was about a year and a half ago when my, my wife died of cancer. She was, a, um, she was a beautiful and godly and talented woman and kind, the kindest person I know. And healthy until she wasn't. And then when the diagnosis of cancer came, it was six months from diagnosis to death. And it's and then you what do you do? You turn you turn to God and you cry out, God, where's the justice here? Don't you even know that this world needs women like her? She's a mother. She's a spiritual mother. We need spiritual mothers. She always uh, was looking to, to mentor the next generation in the gospel and in parenting and in marriage. Oh, we need this. I'm not really sure you know what you're doing. Here. And then when she died, it's, okay, what... What do we do? What do I do now? I I don't know how to be a widower. I don't know how to be a single parent. I don't know how to be a single grandparent. I don't know what new normal looks like. What is normal now? What am I supposed to do, God? How do I do this? I've never done this before. I know you're kind. I know you're good. This doesn't feel good. I don't see your goodness. I don't see your kindness here. I believe it because I know you. I know you're kind. You've been kind to me my whole life. But I don't see it. I don't feel it now. You turn to God and you cry out to Him. And in those lamenting psalms, when that happens, 
out of the 50 of them, 49 of them, there's a moment where there's a, there's a, a, a turn where God reveals himself in a fresh way or in a way that's deeper. And you see him in a fresh, you see him in a deeper, a, a characteristic of him. Or he reminds you of what he's done in the past. And your soul begins to grow. And the revelation of God begins to eclipse the hurt in your heart. It doesn't mean the hurt goes away. It just means God does a work in you. Let me show you in, in Psalm 31. If you want to turn to Psalm 31, this is the psalm we were looking at about David when he was talking about my times are in your hands. Psalm 31. It's a psalm of David. It's a lamenting psalm. He's talk about God being his rock in his time of difficulty. In verse 11 he says, um, well, verse, verse 10. No, verse 9. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I'm in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed my anguish, my years are uh, by groaning. My strength falls because, uh, fails because of my affliction. My bones grow weak. I want to tell you, when you're in deep grief, it goes to your bones. All the way down to who you, to who you are. In the, in the deepest part of who you are, your weeping goes down in there. <laughs> Verse 11, because of all my enemies, I am in utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I've become like a broken pottery. I'm just broken. I'm shattered. I'm shattered. This is not just a bad day. This is not a, a difficult season. I'm shattered. I'm shattered. For I hear... The slander of many, there's terror on every side. They conspire against me, and they plot to take away my life. All my enemies are surrounding me, and they're, they're saying, what's the best way to kill him? Verse 14, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies, from those who pursue me. I trust in you, Lord. So, so David is honest. He has a real situation. He's in real distress. He's honest, though. He says to the Lord what he really feels in his heart. But what I want to show you is what, what God showed me in that whole six months that my wife was sick, and that whole uh, almost year and a half since then, what he's shown me. And it's verse 21. Praise be to the Lord, for He has shown me His wonderful His wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. There's some versions that say when I was in a strong city. Another version says these versions say uh, I was in a besieged city or a city that is strongly held. Okay, and that's what really the Hebrew says. Um, it means a surrounded, besieged city. You know what a, a city under siege is? It's a city that's surrounded by the enemy, and it's cut off, and there's no food, and there's no water or supplies, and there's no hope, and there's no future, and they're waiting to die. That's a besieged city. We're just waiting to die. And David says, that's the place. In a hopeless place. That's the place where God showed me how wonderful His love is. This is the word hesed. Hesed is a word that is translated love or kindness or mercy or tenderness or steadfast love. It's, it's translated many different ways. 
the English, the King James English version uses 14 different words to translate, to try to translate that one Hebrew word. Because you can't say it. It means too much. It's like shalom. Shalom doesn't just mean, hey, hi, or goodbye. It means peace, wellness, wholeness. It means a lot more than just... Hesed means loving, kindness, tender mercies, steadfast love, enduring love. In fact, linguists have never found any language that has had a direct cognate that translates the word hesed. It's unique to Hebrew because it's unique to the Hebrew God. It's who he is. When Moses said, I want to know who you are, show me your glory, okay, I'll tell you, God self-identified to Moses. I'm the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in chesed, full, rich, in love in you. This is who God is. And in the middle of your besieged city, in most of these Almost all of these uh, lamenting psalms in the middle of the darkest place, right down here, whatever your crash and burn place is, He will show His hesitation to you. You can't find it up here.